Thank you very much, everybody, for being here today. Um, and thank you so much for inviting me to actually talk about the challenges and opportunities of building open source communities in the highly regulated financial services industry. So my name is James McLeod, and I'm the FinOS Director of Community. Um, for people who are new to open source, um, I'll you know, pitch my talk, so I'm kind of um, educating you know, on the open source as well. Um, a director of community is somebody, so my background is within software engineering. Um, I haven't worked on mainframe, but I have worked, you know, on uh, .NET and Java and, you know, um, Microsoft SQL Server, etc. And so I'm fully aware of, you know, how to, you know, uh, architect and also build, you know, big complex systems inside um, very big enterprises. Um, but within the open source world, um, you call somebody, you know, who is a software engineer or somebody who has that type of background, but goes out into the community in order to educate either a community manager or a director of community. And so that's what I am. And so I meet um, the open source community on the outside. Now, I'm actually part of the Linux Foundation. But within the Linux Foundation, I actually am part of um, a team which is regarded as FinOS, which is the FinTech Open Source Foundation. And so we are aligned to financial services within the Linux Foundation. And you may have heard of, you know, Kubernetes as part of CNCF or Hyperledger, you know, as, as part of Hyperledger, um, or maybe even GraphQL or, or some of the other technologies that are part of the Linux Foundation. Um, we are part of that family. Um, we are the financial services arm of that, but you know we are actually part of you know a network of bigger you know kind of um, and also uh, integrated technologies such as Kubernetes. Um, we are independent. Um, we are a non-profit membership organisation, which means that you know we don't have um, uh, we don't have people who have shares within the business, you know, we're not looking to actually float or make money in that way. We are actually a non-profit organization, which means that people use us as a, a great gathering point of many different financial services firms, where people can actually speak openly and freely, um, knowing that they're not going to um, kind of breach any competition or, or there's no kind of like ulterior motive, um, which means that, you know, we actually do have um, a really big and growing and dynamic um, community of members, as you can see in this slide. Um, so Gilles, who was just speaking, is actually part of Wipro, um, who are actually part of Finos as well, which is absolutely brilliant. But if you look through our platinum, gold and silver members, not only do we have Wipro, but we also have um, big consultancies like Accenture, Bank of Montreal have just joined as a platinum member. But you'll also notice that City and Goldman Sachs and even GitHub, and for people who don't know GitHub, they are kind of the central repository um, of, you know, a, a fair few, you know, open source projects. So I'd say a fair percentage of open source projects actually reside on GitHub. But we also have GitLab, um, who are also um, part of the membership where you can also kind of collaborate on open source projects. And I'm really pleased to announce that um, Google have recently joined, which is brilliant because they, you know, see the future of financial services contributions into um, open source, um, alongside a load of associate members, which are other foundations and other nonprofits. Um, we have the Alliance for Innovative Regulation, for instance, which is regulatory, um, and also uh, Canadian Registech Association. Um, plus also in the source commons, which um, we'll talk about a little bit later on. So the reasons why financial services firms are actually getting involved in open source, as um, Gilles actually explained, is um, by collaborating on uh, projects that are inside open source, um, you actually reduce the cost of that collaboration. So rather than having the same projects developed internally within a bank, multiple, multiple times, contributed to open source, and all of the banks together can actually work on that same solution to that problem. 
And because you've got um, loads of different engineers and people collaborating, you improve the time to market, and also you can uh, attract and retain talent. And that is actually a big one, as Shiel actually said, because as people are entering software engineering from universities and boot camps and other you know, sources of talent, people are already kind of working in the cloud, already working in open source, and they expect the industry to operate in this way now. With um, everybody looking, you know, at projects from different angles, um, you also de-risk, you know, kind of a lot of the different security concerns. Um, you also reduce vendor lock-in because of the um, licenses that Gilles actually um, uh, spoke about, um, which means you can actually move your software to different vendors. Um, because of the Apache 2 license or, you know, the type of um, license that, that software is using. So you don't buy software and get locked into a specific um, vendor. And also you can simplify the way that engineers and other people contribute into that software. You can actually reduce cycle time and get things shipping really quickly. Um, and also have an ecosystem of interoperability, which means that people are able to share solutions and share data and share the way that software is connected. Now, what this um, means for um, the financial services industry is that we can start bringing uh, lots of different parts of you know, financial services together, such as um, financial, financial institutions, fintech vendors, regulators, and tech firms. Uh, that means that you get like a real diversity of thinking going into, you know, software solutions. So rather than having one team kind of, you know, banging the drum for their solution day on day, you get like the entire industry looking at different ways that you can solve that problem. Um, which means that, you know, you um, expand people's uh, experiences and you get rich talent kind of flowing through the industry rather than being siloed um, into um, specific you know, teams. Now, very quickly, Finos has been around um, for a few years. We're not new. I'm not coming here pitching a new idea. We've actually been established um, since pre-2018. Uh, but in 2018, the Symphony Software Foundation, which is what we were, actually rebranded to Finos. Um, and from that point forward, we, were, we started looking at the horizontal of financial services. Um, and this is where, you know, Capital One, UBS, and also FDC3 was launched. Um, and Red Hat joined and GitHub joined. Um, and we kicked off our um, open source strategy forums. Accelerating through to present day, we have contributions that have been made by JP Morgan, such as JavaScript libraries and WebAssembly called Perspective. Uh, we have FDC3, which is an interoperability standard. Goldman Sachs's contributed legend, which um, enables financial object modeling. Uh, then we also have Morfer, which has been contributed by Morgan Stanley, which uh, enables you to build regulatory and other business logic centrally. And then that gets transpiled into lots of different languages. Um, we have Waltz, uh, which is a crowdsourcing way of figuring out your information and also software architecture and licensing within your bank. Fast forward, fast forward, fast forward. Um, and present day, we have like a rich, diverse um, ecosystem of special interest groups around DevOps, in the source, regulatory um, innovation, and also financial objects. So there's tons and tons of movement and stuff happening within Finos. So why? Why do we get involved in open source, right? So for the people who aren't aware of open source and haven't heard of it, we live in a world of open source. So you may not actually know this, but um, if you are kind of, you know, say for instance, um, on my uh, Mac, I use Visual Studio Code, you know, for um, writing code. If you are using that project, you know, you are contributing or you are using an open source project because Visual Studio Code um, is an open source project by Microsoft. In the same way as all of these various different tools um, support open source on what we call um, DevOps. So the way that we actually automate our um, engineering pipelines now and do those different um, automation. So 
Whether we know it or not, there'll be embedded open source in your libraries that you've got running on your um, local machines or even on your mainframe if you've got any form of containerization or Kubernetes or any form of DevOps running on your Z series. Um, all the way through to using Azure and uh, GCP and AWS and IBM Cloud and you know all of the various different you know cloud service providers. Open source is absolutely everywhere. So what this means within financial services is that um, we need to kind of really understand that we live in an, in that fast paced world right now. And certainly from the type of engineering teams that I was transforming um, within financial services, if they were using Microsoft Project with Gantt charts, it's highly likely that they were using some form of old school industrial revolution software engineering you know, practice. So um, development would happen on one milestone, integration and testing would happen on another milestone, quality testing would happen against another milestone, and security testing and integration and route to live would happen on another milestone. And if any of those type of points there was a failure, you would route back around to the beginning again. That within financial services um, actually creates huge lead times. You know, so at one point we were working in a three, six, five day lead time from a uh, concept of software to getting it out the door, which is far, far too slow. What open source has enabled us to do is to bring that lead time down. So with open source and agile and DevOps, we can automate very quickly through all of our various different checks and balances. We can use libraries from different sources and bring it into our software. And rather than having that 365 day lead time from you know, software um, you know, thinking through to software release, we can get it down to near continuous delivery, providing you know, we have the right kind of checks in place that allow the bank to actually publish that fast. But we call that continuous, you know, agile delivery or CICD or SDLC. Now, it's really great that um, within banks now, you know, we actually have a real continuous cycle of um, software delivery through DevOps, through agile, through open source. But what that can lead to, if you're not collaborating, kind of like um, as part of your culture, is that certain product teams or verticals within your bank are still duplicating effort on certain products or services that they are running, which means that those teams might be working fast, but we can actually increase the efficiency between them, right? So as you can see, these black circles are individual product teams working quickly, but wouldn't it be better if they could collaborate and work even more fast by sharing in between the teams? Now, if you take that model within a bank, that there are individual teams that are working fast, but they're not collaborating, and then scale that across the globe, that means that there's global inefficiencies between teams. And so we need to kind of like try and figure out how we can bring that together. So the connection between people and teams remove the silos that lead to those development inefficiencies. So if you can break down me sitting on one desk solving a problem and somebody else sitting on this same desk over there so solving the same problem for a different team, then you can actually maximize the efficiency between all of your teams. And so in order to do this, it's very simple. You know, so you can actually start at the very basics by creating lunch and learns, conferences and meetups like this one. So we're sharing, we're learning, we're taking ideas away. Um, you can start implementing agile cer ceremonies, you know, such as daily stand-ups, all of those great things, wikis and online forums. That is the start of like the, the shift, you know, towards an open source, you know, culture, just collaboration and, you know, cultural change. And then once you start getting the communication and openness kind of um, uh, started within your bank or with, between your teams, you can then start moving into something that we call inner source, which is 
not only are we sharing and collaborating on ideas, but we can find a collaborative method of actually sharing code and passing code between people and kind of observing what other people are doing and feeding back on top of that. Within the um, confines of your firewall or your enterprise, that is called inner source. It's when people who code, code collaboratively within a single repository and share the outcomes of all of that stuff. So that is what inner source is. Open source communities develop and improve software through code contributions, idea sharing, data fixing, documentation writing even, and continuous education. And so all of those things, so it's not just about code, it's about educating, it's about document writing as well. So if you've got business analysts or people who actually write documentation about the software, they can get involved as well. And when you take all of that type of culture of collaborative and sharing and putting things together into a place where people can obtain and reuse, but do that in a place where people globally can share and reuse, that's open source. And that is what Finos does. So it takes all of that collaboration that you can do on the inside, but it actually spreads it out across the world of financial services. So we, um, the Finless community bridges engineering team silos by solving common financial services technology problems from a collaborative open source vantage point. So what that means is that um, we provide the tools, the mechanisms, we bring the community of experts together, such as open source readiness, the GIL and the Wipro team uh, maintain. Um, we also bring lots of different tools from the Linux Foundation that um, show you how to measure your productivity, give you training sessions that you can um, take you know, online. Um, and we also have something called um, uh, Open Profile, which allows you to build your uh, open source profile of everything you've done, all of your achievements, et cetera. So you can have like an online resume of all of your open source um, contributions. Within Finos specifically, we do um, look after and, and we also um, educate around lots of different projects. You can find these by visiting the Finos um, landscape um, at landscape.finos.org. So you can have a, a good look at you know, all of the projects that you can actually leverage or contribute into. Um, we have lots of different fat flagship projects, as I mentioned before. Um, the, so we have data visualization, data modeling, cloud interoperability, which you can also find on the Finos landscape. We have the open source readiness initiative. So the questions that you asked to Gilles earlier, this is exactly the place where we would answer those. So people who need to understand how to contribute to open source or what is open source. Open source readiness um, is a place where people can drop in, ask questions, maybe contribute answers that they found you know, on their journey through open source and help educate banks and other people on how to get into open source. And then we asked the question, you know, are you ready to join the Finos community? You know, do you actually want to get involved? Um, getting involved in open source, really easy. So there's a real low bar of entry. Um, so the first thing that you can do is look at the landscape, evaluate just, you know, um, just by opening up in the browser and taking a look, you're engaging in open source. Then if you decide that you want to play with something, you can consume it, you can bring it down locally. If you want to participate, you can go onto the Finos um, website, you know, you can look for a community call because we all meet on WebEx and we get together in meetups, or you can then kind of push the parameters of your GitHub a little bit further and you can open an issue or ask a question online. Then as your um, confidence increases, you can contribute to um, a fit, uh, open source project, you can submit a line of code, and then finally you can start leading. And so there's a real great maturity curve that you can actually um, get involved with. And this is where you can find us. So um, if you go to www.finos.org, you can find Finos there. Right. So now I've been looking at the time. Do I have time for a very quick 
demo. Yeah, yeah. I do. Yeah. Right, okay. So what I would like to do is um, kind of take us outside of um, PowerPoint presentations. So I'm, I'm hoping that I've, you know, kind of explained what open source is and what Finos does. Um, and I want to show people how you can actually engage um, in open source. So what I'm actually showing you um, is the microsite for a project that was contributed into Finos by Morgan Stanley. Um, Morfer is a project that allows you to describe um, business logic, such as regulatory business lo logic from a central point, right? So it's like a, a project that has like a central repository of like different types of business logic. And the great thing with this is that once you've described that regulation in one central place, Morfer will then transpile that into Java, JavaScript, TypeScript, Elm, and other um, technologies, mm -hmm. which means that if you need a description of that regu regulation, you can use it in JavaScript in the same way as you can use it in Java or TypeScript or else. And so it removes kind of like the technical debt that you could actually build up around the description of business logic that's scattered across your um, ecosystem of, you know, your enterprise software. So that's what Morpher does. Um, now, Morpher, so this microsite has been contributed to the Morpher project by a creative team. Um, that creative team was made up of somebody who writes JavaScript, so a software developer. Uh, it was uh, made up of somebody who like writes technical documentation, you know, so they, they weren't a developer. There was somebody who could write, you know, complex problems in simple language, absolutely brilliant. Um, and also a marketeer, so a person who has never written in Markdown at all before. Now, this is um, an example of how a very complex uh, project such as Morpher, which is written by two um, or more uh, very senior people within Morgan Stanley, has got contributors into the open source project from Ireland, from London, um, and also from New York, and also from Hungary. And so those people are actually distributed across kind of like the globe, all contributing into Morpha. Not only that, but we also have um, people creating videos um, for Morpha um, that then go into the Finos uh, Resource Center. These have been contributed by another video production company. Um, they have also created uh, fact sheets, which have been contributed into the Resource Center. Um, and they also kind of like link back to um, the uh, Morpher microsite. So open source isn't just for software engineers. Fair enough, software engineers primarily do contribute into open source, but you can be somebody creating videos, you can be somebody um, speaking at a meetup, you can be somebody who's a marketeer, a business analyst, all contributing into an open source project, all sharing ideas and collaborating in very positive you know, ways. Now, when you kind of talk about all of those different types of disciplines and people, this is where GitHub, you know, kind of comes into play because GitHub is generally the place where code is contributed into. And so this is where the project that you would, you know, bring down locally or um, install inside your enterprise lives. So this is the heart and soul of your project. Um, and when you look through GitHub, um, if you look at a project on GitHub, you will have kind of installation instructions of how to use the project and you will, you know, um, find out, you know, what the project is and the reasons why you should actually use it. And also the purpose of you being a um, contributor into that project. So it's kind of where all of the open source community goes to in order to, to feel like they are part of that community. So what I want to show you now is how we can take Actually, I'm on the wrong project. There we go. You know this is a live demo when I'm 
you've gone to the wrong project. So this is Morpher. So all of these tabs here now link together. So all of this is around Morpher. There we go. That's more like it. So what I want to do is take Morpher um, off of the repository on GitHub, and I want to bring it onto my Mac. Right, so what I'm going to do is um, grab the URL um, to the repository, and I'm going to quickly come over here to the BCS Meetup um, folder on my terminal. Let me know if that's big enough. I can make it a little bigger. There we go. Let's go to the back. And you'll notice that there's nothing in there. So if I, if I clone that repository from GitHub, all of the code and everything that um, Morgan Stanley has actually contributed into this project has just come down through uh, the Wi-Fi, and now there's a Morpher um, folder on my on my hard drive. If I then go into there, say CD Morpher, list that out, you'll notice that the um, same file uh, system, so mm -hmm. the same folders, have come down from here, and they're now on my local machine. If I go into the website, so what I'm actually looking to do now is you'll notice that this website, which is got the URL morpher.finals.org, I would like to get that up and running um, on my local computer so I can start developing and contributing towards it. So in order to build the website, so I've downloaded it from GitHub, it's on my computer, I've gone into the website folder, I want to build it. I hit Yarn, right? So Yarn is a, another open source project that takes all of the dependencies for the uh, Morpher microsite from NPM repositories and other dependencies and builds it on my local. So, and when I say local, I mean my Mac that's here. If I hit Yarn Start, You'll notice that um, we'll get some build messages, etc. It's just kicked off a new tab here. And so between you see it building and between here where you see it rolling, there we go. So on local host 3000, we now have the same um, yeah, we have the same microsite built and running. Um, now if I wanted to take that one step further, because this is still in development. I can then open a new tab here in my terminal. I can go up a couple of levels, or go up one level, and I can only open a code editor. And then from there, if I say, yes, I trust the authors, I can go into the documents. Um, that are being rendered for Morpher, I can find index two, okay? And within index two, I can say, hi, this is James, and I can save that. And then hopefully, fingers crossed, if I can find index two, it says, hi, this is James here. And there you go, it's made an immediate change. Um, and then under there, I can say, Hello world, and come back, and hello world is now in there. And so that is um, the day zero um, uh, example of how people can actually contribute directly into an open source project and carry all of your knowledge around the world. Thank you very much. Brilliant. That's great. Thank you very much, James. Um, especially the last part was great. <laughs> Uh, any questions? Uh, yes, um, presumably you've been involved in open source for several years. Um, how yep. much uh, improvement or benefit do you reckon is uh, given to projects? Um, Percentage wise, like is it, uh, does it reduce the overall development? time by maybe about 20%, 40%. Yeah, I mean, I, I would say that um, so you, you, can, you can measure it on many different levels. So yeah. there's um, cost of development. So you can uh, reduce the cost of, de of development because there will, there will be 
software out there that's licensed in a way where you can just use it. So you don't even need to stand up a team. Um, you can come to Finos um, and you can look for maybe a project that you know goes 80% of the way of solving the problems that you need to solve. And so that's a great accelerator. Um, the other way is um, cost of efficiency. So you can actually reduce the cost of engineering um, by having distributed teams solving the same problem from across, you know, kind of the wider community of engineering. Um, and then you can also remove duplication of effort in the same way. Um, so I would say that you could, if I'm going to pick a number out of the air, I think that you could probably increase the efficiency of your projects by 80%. If we use kind of like the 80-20 rule in that way. Um, admittedly, you know, you will need to learn how to do it. But that's the reason why these subs exist and why people like me and Gilles and Reza, you know, and other people who understand the risks and benefits around open source exist. I mean, there are, James, there, there, are, there are historically some data points. Um, so, I mean, the, the IBM years and years ago, I mean, because everyone forgets IBM's one of the world's, if not the world's biggest open source company. Well, now they've bought Red Hat, they certainly are. And there was the, this, the head of IBM saying that for every pound they put into open source, they got seven pounds back. And that's yeah. a measure. Um, I mean, the old years ago, the old head of Red Hat used to say that he was building a five billion dollar business and he was taking out 50 billion dollars of contribution of, of competition to do it, which is a 10 to 1. And I think I, I can't remember, you'd know this one, James, about five or six years ago, it might have been Lloyd's swapped out all their back end systems from proprietary to open source Linux based systems. And they were on the record as saying that their back end costs had gone down tenfold. Um, so yeah. um, there are there are measured data points out there for the benefits of open source. Yeah, I mean, if you look at uh, IBM Z, I mean, you know, Red Hat are actually part of IBM now, and so I'm sure that they're influencing the whole Z series mainframe. But you know, that's highly likely to be built on top of Linux, which has an open source um, kernel, and so open source is kind of you know powering probably your Visa and MasterCard credit cards, you know, that are actually built on top of mainframes rather than cloud. And so, you know, um, it's definitely here to, here to stay. Um, and even if it's, you know, powering your, your BMW, you know, you're sitting behind the wheel of a car that's built on top of um, a, an open source kernel, which is absolutely amazing. 